Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in San Francisco at the Professional Business Women of California Conference, the 28th year. I think Hillary must be in the neighborhood because everyone is streaming up to the keynote room, just getting uh, towards the end of the day. And we're excited to have Adam Smiley on. He's the author of The Quarter Life Breakthrough. Welcome, right. Adam. It's great to be here, thanks for having me. Absolutely, so you gave a talk a little bit earlier on, the, I assume, the theme of kind of your, your general thing, which yeah. is Quarter Life Breakthrough. What is Quarter Life Breakthrough? So this is a book about how to empower the next generation uh, how young people can find meaning in their careers and their lives. So the subtitle of the book is Invent Your Own Path, Find Meaningful Work, and Build a Life That Matters. So everyone talks about millennials, you hear them in the news, oh, they're the lazy generation, right, right. the entitled generation, the me, me, me generation. I actually think that couldn't be further from the truth. So the truth is that actually 50% of millennials would take a pay cut to find work that matches their values. 90% want to use their skills for good. So my book is a guide for young people to find purpose in their careers and really help them uh, find meaning at the workplace and right. help companies empower that generation at work. So, so from being the older guy, um, so then is it really incumbent, you know, because before we, people didn't work for good, they worked for paycheck, right? right? They went, they punched in, they got paid, they went, right. they went home. Um, so is it really incumbent then on the employers now to find purposeful work? And, is, and how much of it has to be purposeful? I mean, unfortunately, there's always some of that, that right. grindy stuff that you just have to do. So and what's, yeah, what's the and balance? Yeah, it's not to say that you know, millennials don't want a paycheck. Everyone wants money. Right, right, like, right. I, I obviously want to make more money than less money. Right. But it's also that this generation is really looking for meaning in the workplace. And one of the main things, if you look at all the studies, whether it's the Deloitte Millennial Study or the IBM Study, this is a generation that wants to move the needle forward on social issues at work. Not just after work or on the weekends, right, right. but at the workplace. And I think it's incumbent upon companies to really think about how they're providing those opportunities for purpose. Both in the mission of the company, what someone's doing every day, and opportunities outside of work, whether it's service projects, paid sabbaticals for people to do purpose-driven projects. Really thinking about how someone is inspired to do mission-driven work uh, every day. Right. It's interesting, Bev Crayer in the keynote talked about somebody, the question I think was, you know, do you have to separate kind of your personal views from your professional views in your social life? And she and she made a very powerful statement. She's like, you know, I'm comfortable enough with my employer that I can say what I feel. Right. And and if there's ever a question they can ask me about it, but I don't I don't gate what I say based on my employer as long as I'm being honest and, and right. truthful. So you know it's an interesting twist on an old theme where before you kind of had your separate worlds, you know, right. you had your work life and your and your home life, but right. now between email and text and social media, there is no kind of there there for work. Right. Just, and it's really in, you know, invaded into the personal. So is that yeah. why the personal has to kind of invade back into the work? And when it comes to millennials, you always, one, th one word that always comes up is authenticity. People do not want to separate who they are at home from who they are at work. Right. They want to be their whole person. Now obviously there's a, there's a, there's a line you don't cross of kind of, I'm not going to tell someone exactly what I think of them or tell a boss you know, to go screw themselves right, right. or insult somebody. Um, or put on social media something that's secret that we're doing at the company. But I think that people want to feel that they get to show up who they are, have their beliefs echoed at the workplace, be able to be their full self, their full values, their mission, their goals, have that reflected in what they do and have people at the company actually acknowledge that. Right. You're not just an employee, I actually know what's going on in your life. I know what your dreams are. I know what your family's going through. I care about where you're headed, right. not just today or while you work here, but when you leave the company. Because that's the other thing is that we're accepting that most of the people entering the workforce now or starting a new job, they're going to be there on average about two to three years, maybe four or five or six years. They're not going to be there 10, 15, 20 years like yeah. they used to be. So how do you actually empower someone to make an impact while they're there and help them find the next lily pad, as I call it, the next opportunity because they're going to have a lot of those lily pads as they go throughout their career. It's interesting, we, we interviewed a guy named Marsha Connor at an IBM event many years ago, and she, she just made a really funny observation. She's like, you know, people come in and you interview them, and they're these really cool people, and, and, and that's why you hire them, because they've got all these personality traits and, and hobbits, habits and hobbies and things that they do, and energy, and then they come into the company, and then the old school, you drop the employee, you know, manual on top of them, basically say, stop being you. Yeah. Stop being the person that we just hired. Right. So that's completely flipped up on its head. Right, one of the things I talked about in the session today was this idea of stay interviews versus exit interviews, right? 
normally when we do performance management, it's kind of like, okay, um, you're leaving, what did you think? Right. Why are you doing that when someone leaves? Right. <laughs> do it right. to be like, hey, what, why would, what would make you stay? Right. What do you want to accomplish while you're here? And you're not being graded against what everyone else is being graded on. You're, what do you want to be graded on? What right. are your goals? What are your metrics for success? Performance achievement versus just performance measurement, yeah. I think is very important for this generation, because otherwise it's like, well, okay, why am I being judged on the standards for that, were, that were written in 1986? You know, this is what I'm trying to do right. here. It's interesting, even Jeff Emmel, the GE, they've thrown out the annual review. Yep. Because um, it's a silly thing, you know, you yeah. kind of collect your data two weeks before and you know, the other 50 weeks, everybody yeah. is just working. I have another hypothesis I want to run by you though, on, on this kind of purpose driven. Um, you know, today, so many more things are as a service, transportation as a service. So, you know, there's, there seems to be less emphasis on things and more emphasis on experiences. That's right. It also feels like it's just easier to see your impact, whether that's writing a line of code or, you know, doing something in social media. And, you know, there was an interesting campaign Casey uh, Neistat did participate uh, yeah. a couple weeks ago, right? They raised $2 million and basically got Turkish Airlines to fly in a couple hundred thousand metric tons of food to Somalia. Um, and my question is, is, is it just because you can do those things so much easier and see an impact? Is that why kind of this, this I, increased I, purpose, purposefulness, I'm struggling on the word. I think the tools are certainly more available for people to take action. Um, I think the connection is there. People are seeing what's going on in the world in a way that they've never been exposed to before right, right. with social media, with communications technology. So it's up front and center. Um, I think that the, also that as technology takes over our lives, um, and you see this with kind of statistics around depression, anxiety, people are starved for that in-person connection. They're starved for that meaning, that actual conversation. Um, we're always doing this, but really a lot of data shows that people experience true joy, true fulfillment, true connection, true experience is what you're talking about when they're in a room with someone. Right, right. So people want that. It, right. So it's kind of a return back to that purpose-driven life, that purpose-driven tribe, village experience because the rest of the time we're on our phones. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's cool, but it's it, something's missing. Yeah. So people are starting to go back to work and being like, I want that inspiration that I may have, that other generations may have gotten from church or, or from outside of work or from their community or from their village or from the elders or you know, from a, a, a youth group or something. They're like, I want that in the workplace. Well, I want that every day. It's more top down, right? I mean, I just think again, the kind of the classic, back in the day, you, you were kind of compelled to give X percentage of your pay to United Way or whatever, right? right? And that was like this big aggregation mechanism that would roll up the money and distribute it to God knows where. Completely different now it's, model than you can yeah. see. And you can see because yeah. of social media and and ubiquitous cell phones all over the place, you can actually see who that kid is that's yeah. getting your thing on the other side. And it's empowering someone to say, okay, this is what's important to me, these are the causes I'd like to support, you know, this is, this is where I want my money to go, and here's why. So what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding uh, of millennials from old people like me, or even older, hopefully? Well, one thing I do, I do think that millennials don't get right is this, this important, the importance of patience. You know, I think a lot of times people say, you know, oh, millennials, they want things to happen too quickly. I think that that's true. I think that my generation, I'm going to be the first to admit that say that we need to do a better job of being patient, being persistent. You can't expect things happen, to happen overnight. You can't expect to start a job and in two months get promoted or to feel like, you know, you're at the board, you know, the, the, with the board of directors. Things take time. Um, at the same time, it's incumbent upon older generations to listen to these young people, to make them feel like they have a voice, um, to make them feel like they're heard and that their ideas matter, even if they don't have the final say to make them feel like they actually matter. Because I think sometimes uh, people assume that they don't know anything. Right, right. They don't know everything, but they have some really brilliant ideas. And if you listen to those ideas, they might actually really be good for the company, uh, both in terms of profit and purpose. Uh, so that's, that's one thing I would say. Okay, and then just, uh, so first time at this show, just get your impressions of, um, of the show. Oh, it's great. This is a great show. You all are doing a great job. Uh, great interview. No, not our show. No, <laughs> I mean the, the PBWC. Well, of course we're doing a good job. We have you on. Uh, uh, I'm at the PWC. It's a great, you know, for me it's really exciting to be, an event, uh, be at an event where I'm one of the only male speakers, because usually I've been doing the speaking circuit thing now for a year or two, and I go to these events, I go to panels, I go to conferences, keynotes, and it's mostly male speakers, which is a huge problem. Um, there's far, far, far fewer women and, and people of color speaking at these events than men. 
Um, and one of the things I'm really trying to change is that, but also pay equity around speaking because I've talked to some of my female colleagues uh, about what they were paid for a specific event and they'll say, oh, you know, well, they covered my transportation, they covered my lift and my, you know, a salad or my, <laughs> you know, hotel maybe. Right. And I'm like, well, I got paid $5,000 that's messed up. We did the same amount of work. Right, we were on right. the same panel or we were on the, you know, doing the same keynote, um, similar experience levels. That's messed up. So I'm trying to change that by doing this thing called the Women Speaker Initiative, uh, which is a mentorship program to empower more women and people of color to be speakers and then to make sure that they're paid fairly when compared to men. So, so how do people get involved with that? They what? should just go to my website, uh, smileypozwalski.com, and check out Women Speaker Initiative. All right. Well, Adam, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes out of your day and uh, great, great topic and I'm sure look forward to catching up again later. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Great to be here. He's Adam, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. We're at the Professional Businesswomen of California Conference, 28th year. Thanks for watching.